Thank you so much for coming. This is the Waltham Land Trust Zoom presentation entitled A Valentine to Our Friends the Flies. And Linda Gretz will be uh, making the presentation. So why? Um, I am Sonia Wadman and I'm the Executive Director of the Waltham Land Trust. Just a couple of quick words about our group. Our mission is to promote, protect, restore, and acquire open space. We are really very much like a friends group. We have events throughout the year, um, usually a walk, at least one walk a month, a fundraiser a month, and some other type of educational activity. We're lots of fun, and we uh, offer all sorts of programs. And we are a membership organization, which means uh, the main way that we're able to pay for our programming and other stuff is when people are dues, pay dues, once a year. And it's only $25 for an individual or $50 for a household. We also have a $15 living lightly um, option. And um, yes, that helps us pay for our Zoom presenters like fabulous Linda, who we love, uh, and the tools and training and folks who are stewards and other things like that, including our new office space. And we might be hiring a second staff person, so your dues will help us with that. Members get our newsletter, which is something we mail or we email to you that's different from our e-news, e different from our e-blasts. In the newsletters, we go into detail about some of the um, campaigns that we're working on. We often have articles written by our historian, Marie Daly, that talk about the history of the open spaces. We uh, share a lot of kind of insider information with our members through our newsletter that comes out in fall and spring. And then our members also get a discount at our ticketed events. Most of our events are free, pretty much all of them, uh, but we do have some major fundraisers and sometimes we do yoga fundraisers outside and those are a lot of fun. That's usually $5 or more less for members. So please consider joining us. Uh, if you just want to make a donation, you can do that as well. And both of these things can be achieved by going to our website, waltfamlandtrust.org. Some of our upcoming events that we have happening, I would like to let you know. Um, a week from today, we're having this amazing kids program, Eyes on Owls of the World. So we are going to have this in person at the Christ Church, which is on Main Street, and it's ideally for children. Right now, um, we are saying that it's for third, fourth, and fifth graders and their families. However, it's really appropriate for any child. And as we get closer to the date, if there's space, I might just open it up to everybody. Um, the, the location where we're having it at can accommodate 60 people. And there is only 20 registered right now. So... Keep your eyes on the website and for my e-blasts, and uh, it's likely I might say, come on down. Um, but that is going to be really great. Six live owls, and these folks, the Wilsons, have been several times to us, to Waltham, and they're just really, really professional people. They're awesome. They bring each owl out individually, and it's just amazing. I mean, they'll come right up to you with the owl, and you can take a picture, and it's awesome. On Thursday, March 7th, we are going to be having a program with Mass Audubon at the Waltham Public Library, and that'll be in person, but we are also going to have a Zoom option, and this is going to be about rescuing wildlife from deadly rat poisons, what Linda and Emily were just talking about a little bit earlier, if you tuned in early. Um, this is a, a, a problem. Our eagles and Hawks and crows and also and pets are eating rats that have ingested rat poison and they're dying. So we are going to work with Mass Audubon um, to spread the word about our advocacy. Uh, the Land Trust has formed an initiative of which Linda and Emily are part, Save Wolf and Wildlife. <clears throat> so we're going to have this meeting with Mass Audubon um, and we're going to be recruiting folks to help us look at rat bait boxes. You might've seen those big black boxes um, that are around town, but we're gonna look for them on city properties and just kind of make notes about them. And we're really trying to advocate to get lidded trash cans 
made available to all Waltham residents ASAP. Um, and other things, there are other, other actions that can be done that'll help reduce the number of rats around and their food sources and whatnot. So there's a couple of different tactics that we're looking into to deal with the situation. So we would love to have more people involved with our efforts. So on March 7th is going to be this program and details about this event and our next one will be on our website next month. So the next event then would be March 12th when we're doing a fundraiser with the Chateau. And that's one of these things, you know, we do all the time. You go to the Chateau on School Street. Um, on our website next week, we'll have a, their certificate that you'll show to them. And uh, that will give you, that'll give us rather 20% of your sale. You still have to pay the full price. I'm sorry. But if you show them the little certificate that says you're a land trust supporter, then we get 20% of your sale. So that'll be on Thursday, Tuesday, March 12th. So information about that and the program with Matt, Mass Audubon will be on our website, as well an email um, address where you can know, send an email and they'll send you the link if you want to join virtually on that March 7th program. Mass Audubon is going to set up that Zoom thing. So check out our website next week for details on those programs. Okay, so on to the show. Everyone, please mute yourselves so we can reduce the background noise. Diana Young, um, you might might see her. She is our host. So she's in charge of somebody unmutes themselves. She might mute you again or whatnot. But uh, Diana's keeping things under control and we appreciate that. Linda is going to ask a couple of questions. So when she does, we ask you to use the raise hand emoji in the reactions box, which is on most people's, the toolbar on the bottom of your screen. Um, or you can just physically raise your hand and uh, and Diana or myself or Linda will see you. And when you are called upon, if you are called upon, then you can unmute yourself. If you yourself have questions, please put those in the chat and then Linda will answer them at the end. And we're going to screen take screenshots of the chat so that if we somehow don't answer them all, we'll try to figure out a way to answer them and, and let you know after the fact. Um, okay, so now a few words about Linda and her background. Linda is an insect enthusiast with a particular interest in the beauty and biodiversity of flies. A lifelong educator, Linda has trained as a teacher naturalist at Mass Audubon's Drumland Farm in Lincoln, where she worked for more than 10 years. Linda is a skillful photographer of all things insect and travels with her husband, Jim Ang, capturing their images. Many of these photos will be shared tonight. Linda, Jim, and their cat, Miss Emma, who I know personally and love, live in Waltham's Highlands neighborhood near Prospect Hill Park, where they frequently walk. They've happily been Waltham Land Trust members for over a decade. So I am going to stop screen sharing my thing, my computer, and ask Linda to turn on hers. And I'm gonna mute myself and we'll see you guys later. Thank you. Am I screen sharing? Is you that one? are, but not the, perfect. Is that it? Oh, you know what? I didn't do the um, little, uh, hold on. You want me to try to use this uh, little spotlight? I'll do my best. I may not use it because I'm reading my notes at the same time. So I'll just try, okay? <laughs> all right. Um, so thank, thank you all for being here. And I want to thank Waltham Land Trust and Sonia Wadman, the Waltham Land Trust's most amazing director for inviting me to share with you my enthusiasm for the flies. And I really hope that tonight it will spark in each of you some kind of wonder and appreciation for these amazing insects. A little more background, I was an art and museum educator by profession who became a naturalist by aspiration. And then I morphed into this enthusiastic student and admirer of insects. Over the past few years, I've become particularly interested in the diversity and the ecology of flies. I noticed how astonishingly, astonishingly diverse they were in form and lifestyle. And so as I wondered about that, I taught myself more. 
My study of insects and flies has also been paired with my desire to understand how we all, we humans and bugs, fit in this world together. What are we doing here, living side by side? What is the nature of our relationship? I've been particularly influenced by the writings of Robin Wall Kimmerer. In her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, she explains how indigenous cultures regard humanity's relationship with nature, not in terms of a resource, but in terms of gratitude, kinship, and reciprocity. Robin Wall Kimmerer urges us to view nature as a source of gifts. So tonight I'm here to talk to you about many of those gifts, and that would be the flies. And my hope is that by the end of this hour, you'll begin to see them that way as well. Because with all they do, they really, really are our friends on the planet. Flies, a nuisance at best, a harbinger of death at worst. The little we know about the fly we don't like. I've seen more people intentionally swat and kill flies than any other creature and without a second thought. But there is another side to the story. The fly is one of nature's great marvels. And that's Dr. Erica McAllister in her book, The Secret Life of Flies. She is the curator of flies at the Natural History Museum in London. And she estimates that there are about 17 million individual flies per person for every human on the planet. And if you read your, her book, you're going to learn that flies pollinate plants, consume decomposing bodies, they eat the sludge in your drain pipes, they kill spiders, consume and or parasitize other insects, some we would call pests, some we would not. They also damage crops and they can spread disease. But that's why I love them, she writes. They do everything, they get everywhere. They're noisy and they love having sex. So her book, The Secret Life of Flies, has been an inspiration to many, and that includes me. So what is a fly? Fly is an insect in the order Diptera. That word comes from die, meaning two, and pteron, wing. There are 160 families worldwide, 105 of those families found in North America. They are generally abundant and found in almost all terrestrial habitats in the world except Antarctica. More than 150,000 species worldwide, but some say it could probably be more than a million. About 20,000 25, species have been identified in North America. Flies, due to the fact that they're not as charismatic as some other insects like butterflies and dragonflies, are greatly understudied. They are a complicated group with astonishing diversity. And they are, a, the most anatomically varied and ecologically diverse order of insects. So what does a fly look like? Take a close look at the uh, insects pictured here. There's nine of them. Um, I can't see everyone. So if someone raises a hand, Sonia, if you could, or Diana, call on them. Um, does, would anyone like to tell me which ones, which of these insects are flies? Anybody want to venture a guess? Do you see any mm -hmm. hands? Mm -hmm. No? Tia. Tia has her hand up, but she's muted. And oh, so she, does Liz. She's, she's got her hand up. Yes. Tia? Tia. They're all flies. <laughs> <clears throat> That's one of my mentors, Tia Penny. <laughs> no fair. <laughs> yes, they're all flies. I hope some of you are just going, what? They're all flies? How can that be? Um, they are. And this is one of the reasons Erica McAllister calls them nature's little marbles. Aren't they gorgeous? I love them all. <laughs> so what, what makes a fly a fly? Well, first of all, fly is an insect. All insects have an exoskeleton. All insects have three body parts, a head, a thorax, an abdomen. They have six legs. They have a pair of compound eyes and a pair of antennae. There's little short ones there. 
What makes a fly a fly? Well, the distinguishing characteristic is that all flies have just one pair of wings, one pair of flight wings. They do have a pair of halteres, this black arrow here, and it's hard to see them here, okay? They're like these knob-ended appendages. Those are attached to the third thoracic segment, whereas the flight wings are attached to the middle one. They have a very mobile head with one pair of compound eyes and complex mouth parts. They have a four-part metamorphosis, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. And fly larvae, also known as maggots, are highly adaptable. Um, they can adapt and they have adapted to a wide range of habitats. That's why they've been enabled to proliferate. But the reason they've been able to uh, adapt to those habitats is because they find something to eat there. So it's all of these characteristics is why they're called nature's great marvels. So before we talk about specific families or species though, we need to look at these important parts. So two wings and two halteres. Dr. Michael Dickinson, a professor of bioengineering and aeronautics at California Institute, probably knows more than anyone else about how flies fly. You can watch his talks and read his papers online. His, he discusses aerodynamics, muscle physiology, and neuroscience to explain how flies fly. I think he's brilliant. He's also a MacArthur winner. And here's what I've learned so far. The flight wings depend on two kinds of muscles. Here's the flight wings here. Here's the thorax. This is the middle segment of the thorax. That's one set of muscles powers them and another group of muscles are for fine control. Filling most of the thoracic cavity are four pairs of large muscles providing mechanical power. And then there's 18 pairs of small muscles that provide the nervous system with the means for fine control of wing motion. Next, you have the halteres here on this crane fly. You can see them protruding out there, okay? The halteres are essentially hind wings that have evolved into advanced high-speed sensory organs. They send messages to the fly's brain about flight and uh, position. They oscillate rapidly in time with the wings like a gyroscope. They provide balance and guidance while in flight. And it's because of these structures, the halteres, that flies can do some incredible maneuvers that other insects can't. They can fly backward, they can hover in place, they do 360 degree turns, they even fly upside down. But Dickinson will tell you that flight, however, is about the entire fly. It's not just the wings and the halteres. The large compound eyes, the three simple eyes or ocelli, external structures and sensors that are all over its body. All of this collects information that's sent through the fly's nervous system onto the fly's brain that controls the musculoskeletal system, which determines and sends back information on how the wings are to move, what the fly needs to do to navigate through wind and space to avoid obstacles and predators. What amazes me is all of this data is collected and processed within the fly's brain, the brain of every fly, even the tiniest of all, some of them no bigger than the head of a pin. And if that doesn't take your breath away, well, I don't know. <laughs> Next, we come to the flock, to the eyes. And I really, I'd love to talk about how beautiful they are. And because as you can see, they're really large. Um, other, a lot of other insects just don't have eyes that are as big as these. Fly eyes are composed of three to 6,000 lenses or omatidia. Dragonflies have 30,000 or more omatidia, which is 10 more times than flies. But here's the thing, the fly omatidia are much larger. And each one of these lenses contains a cluster of photoreceptor cells that sends messages to the fly's brain. These messages are critical when it comes to flight. Flies are unable to bring things into sharp focus. They have poor spatial resolution, but they do have a great view of everything left, right, in front, and above them while they're flying as well as standing still. And they can respond really quickly. 
Scientists say that flies have the fastest visual systems on the planet, which means they have an ability to process all this information and respond very fast. And they can do this actually, they can get out of the way of danger 10 times faster than humans can. In addition to a pair of compound eyes, like most uh, insects, flies have simple eyes or ocelli. Um, it's believed the simple, aid, fly, simple eyes, which means they're only one lens, aid in um, flight and help determine the horizon and contract changes in body rotation. And then looking in the middle at that big uh, photo, um, some fly species have really cool color patterns like the soldier, soldier fly pictured here. It's an area that's been studied very little, but one theory is the patterns may act as color filters to aid in finding food, a host, or maybe a mate. And one last thing I wanna to touch on is that males often have eyes bigger than females. So look at this cute little stiletto fly in front in the middle here, and his big eyes, you think he could hardly hold up his head the weight of those things. And this is a male green bottle fly with gorgeous, gorgeous red flies. Okay, next the antennae. Vital sensory organs, part nose, part navigator. Covered in tiny hairs, they're sensitive to changes in air currents as the fly moves. And when in flight, the antennae help a fly detect obstacles so they can avoid crashing into them. The antennae also function like a nose and provide a keen sense of smell so the fly can find food, or in the case of a male, a female for reproduction, which is kind of like us humans, right? Because we follow our noses all the time. You smell chocolate chip cookies in the kitchen and you go down to eat them. When some people wear perfumes to attract the mate. So, and like, and like our noses, not all fly antennae are alike. As you can see here, far from it. Now, most flies have short stubby antennae. Remember this, short stubby antennae, okay? Like this little serpent fly. Um, but some have long slender ones, like this green fly down here. And some have feathered antennae, like here. Now, here's one that's sort of an exception, this mid-length uh, antennae, which come together in a curious little post here in the center. And then some have fuzzy uh, antennae, like this very small moth or drain fly, which I bet you've seen in your home and you thought it was a moth. Um, and the fuzzy antennae just kind of help complete the disguise. But let's move on to the mouth. This is really the, another really critical part of these marvelous insects. Flies consume a myriad of food sources, and that's because their mouth structures have evolved in a myriad of ways to consume them. Not all mouths of adult flies are structured the same, which is very unlike uh, some other insect groups like dragonflies or butterflies. All those adults, their mouths are basically the same, but not so in the flies. So flies have one of two basic structures. At the top left, you see a piercing sucking mouth. This is a female mosquito. And on the other side here, we see the spongy sucking mouth uh, structures. The two flies here at the bottom look like they're wearing gas masks. Those are their spongy sucking mouth parts. And then these flies here have a long pointed proboscis. You'd almost think it was like a butterfly, but those doesn't work that way with them. But this is also a proboscis that's just evolved as a variation on the spongy sucking mouth. So let's look a little more closely. Um, these mouth structures are incredibly complex and these are very, very simple uh, diagrams. Uh, and when you look at what real detailed diagrams are, it's kind of mind boggling. So let's just do a, a light overview. Here's the spongy sucking mouth, um, mm -hmm. very broad and flat, soft and fleshy. Here's a surfed fly that has a variation of that spongy sucking mouth. And then to the right, the piercing sucking mouth. This is the head and mouth of a mosquito. Um, this is what the kind of mouth that the biting, so-called biting flies have, black flies, uh, midges, 
Um, this long proboscis here is really a sheep and it contains six parts and it's kind of like a toolkit. Um, I won't go into the description of how that works, but it's pretty interesting. Um, but the mouth structures are just part of the story because as they eat, they do other things. So some flies will apply an enzyme to its food source to soften it, to eat it. And some flies, black flies, they'll apply an anesthetic to your food source before eating it. And maybe you've, now I know at least, I'm allergic to black flies. I never feel them biting me and now I know why. Um, and blood feeding mosquitoes, they inject an anticoagulant. So by now, maybe you've thought, wow, they're master consumers. Now there is a difference between what the larvae and what the adults eat, which we'll talk about when we get into specific uh, flies. So um, while I'm talking, just take a look at that menu, right? On the upper left is a robber fly consuming a moth, living insect eater. On the right, we've got some bottle flies that are enjoying some fresh dung. And on the bottom right is the leaf mine. And that leaf mine was made by the larva of an agromosity fly. Um, leaf mines are fascinating. The insects that live inside and the little larvae just eat the middle layer and they exit when they're ready to pupate and go somewhere to merge as an adult. It's a really cool subject. If you are interested, look up the amazing Charlie Eisman. There will be links to his website and blog on the resource page. So by now, maybe you also are beginning to see how ecologically important flies are. Being one of the most successful dominant and insect groups on the planet that can't be ignored. They are an essential food chain component. At every stage of their life cycle, flies are food for thousands of species of animals. Birds especially are in need of flies. Fly catchers depend on adult flies to feed their young. Swallows devour them by the thousands, as do bats that fly at night. Flies are essential pollinators, second only to bees and wasps, as pollinators of the world's cultivated and flowering plants. Flies are more important than bees when it comes to pollinating certain food crops, crops like mangoes, avocado, and chocolate. Flies are essential decomposers and recyclers, eating and breaking down the world's dead and decaying organic matter. You think they're horrid, dirty insects, but they are not. They're busy making the world a cleaner place for you to live in, wrote Jean Henri Fabre, a French teacher and scientist whose work contributed much to shaping modern entomology. Flies will feed on almost anything, including food waste, animal feces, and rotting carcasses, which explains why they live in such close proximity to us. Scientists say if it weren't for flies, we'd be knee deep in all of it. And finally, flies help maintain balance in nature, especially within other insect populations. They can be important and useful in biocontrol. So now we're ready to meet some of those flies. There are basically two general categories for flies, nematocera, the thread-horned, and brachycera, short-horned, which refers to the difference in the lengths of their antennae. Now these are not official taxonomic groups, but the difference in morphology between, these, it, between them is really easy to see. And that's why it remains useful. The Nematocerans are the oldest group dating back about 260 million years. The adults have slender bodies, long narrow wings, piercing sucking mouth parts and long antennae. Many males have antennae that are highly plumose looking like delicate feathers like you can see here in this midge over here. This old group of insects includes mosquitoes, crane flies, gnats, black flies, midges, and so-called biting flies. All nematocerin larvae and pupae are aquatic, making them an essential component of the aquatic food chain. Most of these larvae feed on aquatic microorganisms. Some feed on larvae of other nematocerans. 
Many of the adults do not eat, but those that do are important pollinators, like the March fly pictured on the right, which is inspecting a beautiful blueberry flower. Some nematocerans feed are sanguivores, but of those species, only the females will feed on blood as needed. Males, on the other hand, feed on nectar. The vast majority of nematocerans are not harmful to humans. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of nematocerin larvae, pupae, and adults as fundamental food chain ingredients for life on our planet. I've just got to digress for a little bit because I took the photos here of all the insects here. And some of the most wonderful moments I had when I was teaching at Drumlin Farm was during ponding. Um, with the simplest of magnifiers, the giant world of pond life opens up and it's quite a revelation. It's a world that's as infinite as outer space. And I, I actually wish all of you tonight could have an opportunity to do some exploration of freshwater pond life. It's as good, maybe even better than going to an aquarium. Though most of the flies I'm going to show you tonight are brachycerans, I first want to introduce you to an interesting family of nematocerans, ones that are common and easy to see. And I'll close my discussion of this group by introducing you to a lovely large mosquito that I think might surprise you. So here's some crane flies. Almost every kind of aquatic or semi-aquatic or habitat is home to some kind of crane fly larvae. These are beneficial decomposers. They feed on decaying plant matter. And aquatic crane fly larvae are an important food source for larval and adult aquatic insects, amphibians, fish, turtles. And crane fly larvae that dwell in damp places are a food source for spiders, centipedes, and predatory beetles. Most adult crane flies do not eat and live only a few days. Their main goal, oh, you know, like all adult insects really, is to mate and lay eggs for the next generation. But the adults are an important food source for birds, spiders, and other insects. So when you're looking for uh, crane flies, look for long legged slow flyers in moist woods and near water, generally not above, far above ground. This uh, slide features a beautiful crane fly I actually saw uh, on a moist rock. This is in Vietnam. And mm -hmm. I was just drawn to the way it glistened and to the iridescence it looks to me like it was fashioned out of blown glass with a very graceful glass fountain tip, fountain pen tip for its abdomen. So here's a few crane flies that you could see um, in our area. One interesting characteristic about them actually is they lack simple eyes. They don't have any ocelli. I wonder if that's why there aren't very good uh, flyers. But Crane flies are drawn to your light. So I get them at my moth lights every summer. Up top left is a mating pair. Bottom right is a um, beautiful uh, crane fly that I see also during the day. The tiger crane fly, top right in the woods. And this beautiful big tipular species that flew onto my car windshield and cast some wonderful shadows. These are all crane flies that you could see locally. And the next one you're going to see is one of the most beautiful crane flies you can see locally, the phantom crane fly. Mm -hmm. And the name really suits them well. They don't really fly. They drift on air currents close to the ground. They're kind of ghost-like and the black and white pattern enables them to just kind of appear and disappear in the light. It's kind of like a cloak as they move. Look for them in boggy and marshy habitats. Their legs are essentially hollow and they move with them outstretched. The first segments of their long feet, these are very long feet, um, are hollow and contain internal structures that have air, sac air sacs that help them drift. They are true phantoms of the wetlands. On the left, we have a mating pair. This is a female, see her abdomen is kind of beige. And this is the male who's just hanging on, dangling from her while she, she can even fly with him like that. Over here's another mating female. You can't, these are abdomen, you can't see the male. And this is another male pestering her, um, 
trying to uh, barge in on the action, I guess. And in the center is a male, he's minus a wing, but uh, it lets us see how uh, his full body there, it's very beautiful. Um, phantom crane flies don't eat, the adults don't eat. And after mating, the female will dip the tip of her abdomen into water to deposit her eggs, where the larvae will live in the muck at the bottom and feed on the microbes of decaying plant matter. They're really one of the most charismatic of all fly species. And you know, when we're watching crane flies, everybody whispers. <laughs> so now mosquitoes. And I bet some of you might be surprised to find out that mosquitoes are actually true flies. Um, and I, you know, maybe I thought I wasn't going to talk about them, but I don't want to sugarcoat any of your perceptions. And we need to talk about the good that they do and what we call the good and what we call the bad. There are over 3,000 species of mosquitoes. And for all adult mosquitoes, male and female, their primary food source is plant sugars. Their function as pollinators, though, is one of their most overlooked valuable functions. In the Arctic, where hordes of mosquitoes thrive, many plants depend on them for pollination. And this is interesting. As for the species that feed on blood, first of all, only the females do that. Okay, so why? Well, you can blame it on the babies. The baby larval diet is aquatic algae and plant matter and it's lacking in protein. Like all insects, the health of the adult depends on what the young eat. So in order to develop healthy eggs that will hatch into robust larvae, some female mosquitoes need a protein-rich meal of blood. Which brings us to the very ecologically important role of the larvae. All mosquito larvae are aquatic. They feed on algae, protozoans, and microbes. Mosquito larvae and pupae are part of the aquatic food chain, vital food sources for amphibians, fish, reptiles, birds, other aquatic larvae, and adult other aquatic larvae. Adult mosquitoes are a critical food source, especially for birds, frogs, and bats that consume them by the millions. But I want you to meet one of the very amazing non-biting mosquitoes. And for those of you here in Waltham, this was pretty exciting because I came upon this large iridescent insect feeding, uh, feed, insect feeding on tansy flowers in Prospect Hill Park, right up the hill from me. It was huge, it was beautiful. And by the feathered antennae, I thought, well, I never thought midges came that big. So I took a lot of pictures, downloaded it when I got home and I found it, no, it's not a monster midge, it's a mosquito. Um, and it turns out it was a mosquito called elephant mosquito. And when I first saw the name, I thought, why? Because it's so big. And then I read some more and no, it's called that because of the male's elaborate maxillary palps that jet out straight from its mouth and curve upward. Okay, so here's the head. These are the fuzzy antennae. And maxillary palps are food, uh, I mean food, sorry. Maxillary parts, palps are mouth parts that can be used for food finding. I think these are for mate finding. And notice the curve. They look like really majestic elephant tusks. So that's how it got its name. And here's his beautiful long proboscis, just feeding on nectar. Um, this is kind of interesting. The females don't have those long palps. And when they get together and they mate, they do that in midair and their wings beat together at the same frequency. So the female deposits her eggs while hovering over her chosen location such as some nice standing water in a tree. And she flexes her abdomen. She flings the eggs down onto the water surface. The elephant mosquito larvae then feed on the larvae of other mosquito species. So that makes them a group of mosquitoes beneficial to humans. And elephant mosquitoes have been deployed as biocontrol for disease vector mosquitoes in places like Texas, Vietnam, Uganda, and Samoa. So that ends my discussion of nematocerans, and we're going to move to the brachycerans.
These are younger than the nematocerans, appearing only uh, 200 to 180 million years ago. And they're a much larger group, 120 families, 80,000 species worldwide. And this group includes the flies most of you are probably familiar with, like green bottle flies, house flies, fruit flies, little creatures most people wouldn't consider all that attractive. But some of the most beautiful and fascinating flies are brachycerans. Their most distinguishing characteristic, they're short and tenny, in addition to having robust, chunkier bodies when compared to nematocerans. Brachycerans are also more highly specialized than nematocerans. You can call them ecologically innovative. They've adapted to an impressive range of habitats and given their incredibly broad range of preferred food sources, they employ an equally diverse range of feeding strategies. And brachycerans are among the most ancient pollinators of flowering plants. So let's meet some of the ones that have evolved to look like bees. There are four insects pictured here, but only one of them is a bee. So in order to know which one, we need to know what to look for. So I want you all to look real hard. I hope your screens are big enough so you can see. Look, let's look at the antennae. Are they short and stubby? You have a fly. Are they slender and long? You have a bee. Look at the eyes. Are they large? Do they occupy most of the head? That would be a fly. Are they small or medium sized, more to the side? That would be a bee. And what about halteers? Do you see any halteers? And if so, then you know for sure you have a fly. So does anybody other than Tia want to say which one of these is a bee? Somebody want to say? Any hands up, Sonia, Diana? I'm looking. In the I middle? thought Phyllis's hand go up. The bees in the middle? Yeah. Yeah, long antennae. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. That's right. Um, long antennae. I love how these two look so much alike. Um, but yeah, here's the short ones. And then look at these big, beautiful eyes. All right. More bee mimics then. And a wonderful group of uh, flies, uh, the surfage. And you know, you probably have all seen surfage flies when you've been looking at flowers and you thought you were looking at bees. There's 6,300 species of them worldwide, 800 to 900 in North America. Their common names are flower fly or hover fly because that's their key trait. They feed at flowers, they hover in flight. And the adults feed on nectar and pollen and are outstanding mimics that achieve protection by looking like, and in some species, even behaving and sounding like a bee or a wasp. The surfid lar larvae, like all fly larvae, by the way, they're egg eggless and they're tapered soft body, they have munching mouth parts, are predators. They're predators of other insect larvae. Some feed on decaying or living plant matter, some feed on fungi and bacteria. So their ecological niche is twofold. Adults are perhaps the most important pollinating family of flies, and many larvae aid in pest control. Adult females will lay eggs on plants near or among aphid colonies, for example. And of those species, a single larva can eat 20 to 30 aphids in a day. So what about their flight? There's a terrific field guide to flower flies by Jeffrey Skevington and Michelle Locke. Nice book here. Can you all see it? Probably not. I guess you can't. Um, and they assert that surfids are among the best flyers in the animal kingdom. They can hover in place, fly backwards, and zip off in one direction or another. By comparison, bees and wasps have slower wing beaks they do not hover in flight. They are always, when they're flying, they're always moving in one direction or another, and they make rounded corners, not angular turns when they change direction. And putting in a plug for native plant gardening, surfids like our native bees select native plants to feed on. And some of my favorite ones are pictured here because they're really beautiful and I just love, I love watching them. 
I love their iridescence and the graceful proportions. In the center is the head of a male. Uh, this is uh, the male here. See those eyes touching each other? You can see his little proboscis. And three of these uh, photos are of Eastern calligraphers. Here's one here. You can see the um, halteers. This is an Eastern calligrapher. And this is, uh, they're very small, by the way, but they're actually very easy to see. And they seem to be really um, very friendly and photogenic. This is a mating pair of Eastern calligraphers that I followed around this stand of, uh, of uh, goldenrod. And they were just so happy flying together. I swear, I swear they were smiling. Surfaces, a model system for research into mimicry. Among the larger surfaces, many species have evolved to become near perfect mimics. And these are some really good examples. At the top left is a hairy eyed mimic fly. When I first saw this, I heard it actually, and I thought for sure it was a bumblebee. And then I saw the eyes, this one here, and below it, another wonderful bumblebee mimic. And to the top right is a surfid fly, variable aphid eater, and at the bottom, common drone fly, very commonly seen around, uh, around flowers. What's interesting about these two on the bottom is they belong to a family called Aristolionae, and the Aristolionae larvae have a common name, rat-tailed maggot, which I think is kind of an awful name because it really doesn't describe the good they do for our environment. These larvae live in wet, decaying organic matter. They live in mud, manure, and silage. They filter feed on microorganisms. And it's hard to breathe in those environments. So the rat-tailed maggot has evolved a very long, thin siphon on its rear end. It looks like a naked tail, but acts like a snorkel that ascends to the surface for oxygen. So if you ask me, filter feeding on microorganisms in such difficult environments, Rat-tailed maggots are doing us a favor. They're just trying to clean house. And by the way, you can actually watch them do this on YouTube. It's kind of cool. All right, more, more bee mimics in the bee fly, flam bee, bee fly family. There's about 5,000 species worldwide, 800 or more in North America. Some say they are the cute bee mimic with the dark side. The adults feed on nectar and pollen. You can look for them hovering in front of and on flowers. And bee flies are widespread throughout the world and in North America, most of them found in dry sandy habitats where some are important pollinators of desert plants. So while adult bee flies are harmless and helpful pollinators, the young bee fly larvae aren't quite as endearing. Most bee fly larvae are parasitoids more exactly ectoparasitoids, which means they attach to the outside of a single host to grow and develop. And most bee fly hosts are the larvae and pupae of bees and wasps. They have some interesting egg laying strategies. Adult females of some species drop bomb their eggs into nest sites of the hosts for their larvae, and it earns them the nickname bomber flies. These females have this unique storage structure underneath the abdomen at the posterior. It's called a sand chamber. And she gets into the sand and she fills it. She kicks it um, full of sand. And you can actually watch this on YouTube too. And she'll coat each sticky egg with sand just before its aerial release. So it's thought that the sandy coating improves the egg's trajectory by adding weight to it so it can make its target. And it also ensures its survival by slowing down egg dehydration while the larva is waiting to hatch. And it could also mask biochemical cues that would trigger a host to toss it out of her nest. Look for bee flies hovering like hummingbirds when they feed. Like surfids, they're skillful in flight but it's not unusual to find them resting close to the ground on a rock or leaf with their wings spread because that puts them in a good place to scope out the home of a ground nesting bee or wasp. So on the right, you have a 
beautiful greater bee fly with a long proboscis here resting on a leaf. And this is a tiger bee fly. These two species you can see um, in our area. And these three species uh, are from some of my trips in the Southwest, a beautiful uh, banded bee fly here. And these two really small ones, I especially like this little Odortus with his uh, extended uh, proboscis while it's feeding on rabbit brush. This is probably a good time to talk about the difference between parasite and parasitoid. Parasitoids kill their host. Parasites generally do not. Ectoparasitoids attach to the exterior of a host as in these bee fly larvae, but endoparasitoids live inside them. Which brings us to our next group of flies, the canopidae or thick-headed flies. Some, like the ones pictured in the top, look remarkably like wasps. Canopidae larvae are internal parasitoids of adult insect species, such as adult bees, wasps, ants, crickets, and cockroaches, and they probably inspired the script writers for aliens. Adult conopids are found, commonly found on flowers, sipping a diet of nectar. The proboscis, by the way, is not retractable. Instead, it's jointed or hinged at the base, so it can be conveniently raised to different angles for feeding. And it folds beneath the body when it's not used. The bee and wasp host conveniently are found on flowers. This makes it easy for an adult female to find a host midair. She grabs it and quickly deposits an egg, single egg inside it. And the most common thick-headed flies in our area you'll see are these two up here, but it's worth looking for these real cute little ones. Um, this little uh, Myopa genus. Um, the female here has her, they actually have a um, joint also mid in the mid length of the proboscis as well as at the base. And these little Zodion uh, mating flies their proboscis is jointed just at the base. And now that comes, we come to uh, one of my favorite families, the robber flies. The adults, these adults are apex predators in the insect world. They dine on anything they can seize out of midair from small flies to larger insects like moths, bees, wasps, and dragonflies. Notice the long legs on these flies. They're very bristly and hairy. Um, they use them to capture and carry their prey. The front four legs kind of shape a basket around them and they go to a perch to have their meal. And the robber flies short stout proboscis right here. They use that to inject um, a neurotoxin into the, the prey which immobilizes them. And then they inject an enzyme that can turn the body into a digestible liquid. And I know this doesn't sound very pretty, but a lot of insects do this, um, assassin bugs, ambush bugs. Um, it's just how they were designed to eat. And the robber fly larvae, by the way, are also predatory. They live in soil and feed on eggs, larvae, and small soft-bodied insects. Um, I think they're really beautiful, actually. Um, most robber fly uh, species, here's some other beauties, um, are great bee mimics, especially this nice bumblebee mimic down here. And many of them have this mystax, you can see here, which is like a little mustache. It's fine hairs that grow between the eyes um, and above the beak. It's believed that actually this protects the robber fly's head and face from its struggling catch, which is often cumbersome and larger than itself. All the robber flies here and on the previous slide are in the genus Lafria, and they're very popular with insect enthusiasts like myself because they are so bold. They're kind of cool looking. They have those big dark eyes. They remind me of people wearing sunglasses or just to look cool, you know? And they're very, very fun to watch. But what makes robber flies such good hunters? You have to look at their eyes. Researchers have found that the omatidia in a robber fly eyes are different sizes. 
The ones toward the center are larger than the ones to the side. And this size arrangement gives them a high resolution image of its surroundings. And that's not typical of other flies. Also note how the large eyes are positioned on the head. They're not close together. They're much more to the side and spaced apart. And that's a position of another apex insect predator, by the way, the dragonflies and the damselfly. But their hunting prowess would be nothing without their remarkable flying ability. Once a robber fly takes off after a target, it can quickly maneuver itself in midair when its prey changes direction. And that's the eyes sending split second messages to the brain so it can direct the wings to make a change and make it fast. And think back now to Michael Dickinson, who tells us flight is about everything. It's about it all working together, the whole flight system. And that's what makes this robber fly a very, very formidable predator. So our last group of, ins of flies that we're going to be look at, uh, looking at come from some of these families. I think most of you now would agree that these are all pictures of flies. This probably is the image you had of flies when you came into this uh, talk at the beginning. Um, we see them everywhere, in and outside our homes. They're from five different families, though. All five of these are from different families. So the larvae in two of them dine on carrion. Another, the larvae feed on dung. And yet another, the larvae are parasitoids. The fifth one down here is a lovely root maggot fly. And those larvae feed uh, on fresh vegetation, plant stems and roots. But I'm gonna wind up the talk tonight to talk just about the four, these four other groups. And I'll begin with my favorite, the tachinids. Um, this is a family that I actually had to learn to love. When I first saw them all covered with those bristles and hairs and I looked at the pictures, I don't know, it took me a while to really warm up. And now I think some of them are real cute like this little guy up here, right? This is one of the largest dipteran families, uh, about 9,000 species. And Stephen Marshall calls the tachinids the ultimate fly family because they are unparalleled in a variety, in variety of size, shape, and color. And they have an amazing range of strategies and behaviors. And the best place to look for adult tachinids is on flowers, where you'll find them feeding on nectar. But why just nectar? Well, because unlike some mosquitoes we talked about earlier, tachinid larvae consume plenty of protein. And they do that because they are parasitoids of other arthropods, most commonly caterpillars, the larvae of butterflies and moths. But they do also consume larvae of centipedes, spiders, scorpions, and other insects. But as parasitoids, tachinid flies are an important component of nature's balance. Some species are very host specific, which makes them particularly useful when it comes to pest control. The flies in the top two photos are in the genus Ger Geriniopsis. The adult females deposit eggs in the host habitat, generally would be like a leaf that caterpillars feed on. And like most tachinid, this is interesting, the females incubate their eggs internally so that once the egg is laid, the larva hatches immediately after being deposited. And at the bottom are these um, feather-legged flies. These are actually really common around here. They're gorgeous. The center is a male, um, beautiful eyes. And then on the right is a female. Look at her showing off those feathered legs. We don't know why they have them, but they're quite lovely. So now we come to the Sarcophagidae and the Muscidae. These are among the most ubiquitous and familiar looking. And I actually was kind of thinking of skipping these two groups for the sake of time, but um, I think I'd be doing you a disservice if I did. They do us all a world of good. The Sarcophagidae here, also known as flesh flies. The adult flies kind of look like house flies, but they're slightly larger and they have three stripes on the thorax three stripes on the, on the thorax. Um, the adults feed on gooey liquids, including sugary materials like nectar and sap. And the larvae will eat carrion and dung. 
being the first to arrive at these ephemeral food sources is an advantage. So the, get this one, the female sarcophagidae do not drop eggs. They deliver living larvae directly onto the food source. And that gives those babies an advantage to hit the ground running. So it can be very, very difficult to identify them to species, but you can identify them to family sometimes when you see the tail light, red tail light and red headlights. Red tail light, red headlights, sarcophagy. Now let's talk about the muscids. The most famous fly in this family might be the house flies, the musca genus. Um, but you know, this isn't necessarily the fly you're gonna see in your home. In fact, uh, I've never had any in our, um, our home. We generally get the green bottle flies. Um, but house flies do thrive in places where humans have deposited all sorts of dung and garbage. Millions of larvae clean up after us, consuming rotting food and meat, as well as bacteria-rich human and domestic animal waste. The problem is these sites are teeming with pathogens and adult houseflies have an ability to inadvertently carry these pathogens on their mouths and feet back to us. So yes, their affinity for dung and garbage and carrion can make them vectors for carrying disease, but we're the ones who burdened them with an awful lot of garbage. So their role as environmental sanitation workers should not be overlooked. In fact, research is being done to find ways to farm these larvae using livestock manure, to use them to get rid of it. This is a free resource in our meat-eating society, right? So you get the larvae to eat it all up. And then when they're big and fat, you gather them up and you dry them out and you feed them back to the animals that produce it, or at least some of the animals like chickens and pigs. And that's being done right now. It's pretty interesting. Ah, California. This is a wonderful, uh, wonderful family of flies, really. Um, this is our final slide. And it these, I think, might be familiar to you. The metallic, these metallic beauties. Um, they're not fussy eaters, the adults. Um, they'll feed on dung or carrion, nectar, and other sweet fluids. The top right is a black blue fly. All these others are green bottle flies. And that common name is, is, uh, comes from an old English term fly blown, which refers to something that's become tainted as evidenced by fly eggs and maggots that have appeared on or materialized on its surface. And here lies the clue for the flies linked to forensic science. And that is older than you think. It dates back to the Chinese Song Dynasty in 1247, when the first forensic science book was written. It was called The Washing Away of Wrongs. Beautiful poetic name. It was written by Song Qi, who was a physician and a judge. This book laid down the fundamentals for modern forensic entomology, and it describes the first recorded account of someone using it to solve a crime. Very briefly, in 1235, a murder was committed. It was determined that a sickle was used as a weapon. Local suspects were gathered. They placed their hand sickles on the ground and shiny green metallic flies began to buzz around just one of them. None of the other sickles attacked, attracted the beautiful flies. See, using their great olfactory senses, the blow flies smelled traces of blood that were on the blade. And as the judge, the magistrate turned to the owner, the owner confessed. So there are many ways forensic entomology is employed. And one is predictable, timely succession of how fly species and other insects arrive at a corpse. Blowflies are the first to lay eggs at the scene. And once the eggs hatch and the larvae grow, they grow from one stage to the next. It can be term determined then how long they've actually been there. And according to Jonathan Balcom in his book, Superfly, which is a fascinating look uh, at a wide range of fly research, blowflies are the most accurate indicators of time of death. And here's something else really interesting and cool that these flies do for us. 
creepy and slimy as they are, the maggots are efficient consumers of dead tissue. They will munch on decaying flesh and leave healthy tissue alone. Get that, they leave healthy tissue alone. Maggots have been used by battlefield surgeons for centuries to clean wounds, dating back at least to the time of Napoleon and used during the Civil War, the American Civil War. In World War I, American surgeon William Baer noticed that soldiers with maggot infested gashes did not display the expected infection or swelling that was seen in other patients. Researchers, researchers have only recently discovered that the slimy secretion from these maggots, it contains a remarkable healing element that keeps inflammation down. So with the rise of penicillin in the 1940s, that made clinical maggots less useful, but their use has bounced back in the 1990s when antibiotic resistant bacteria created a new demand for their treatment. In 2004, the US Food and Drug Administration approved maggot therapy as a prescription for wound treatment. So there you have it. There's my introduction to the flies. At least I hope after this hour, you've begun to see that they truly are our friends. We've barely scratched the surface with 25,000 species and 105 families in North America. There are so many more to see, so much more to learn. All the flies here represent families I sadly was not able to talk about tonight. The flies are everywhere and so are we. Diphtherians have reached just about all corners of the earth, so have we. They've evolved the most ingenious adaptations to do so, and so have we. We humans are everywhere. We put our hands on everything we find and we design whatever we need in order to get what we want. And like some of the flies, we can do harm in the process. Only we're the conscious ones and they are not. And the harm we humans do is on a much wider scale. Terry Tempest Williams, another author, conservation, conservationist, and environmental activist I admire, tells us human exceptionalism is killing the planet. We are not the center of the universe. Rather, we are a dynamic part of it, she affirms. Our sense of community and compassionate intelligence must be extended to all life forms, plants, animals, rocks, rivers, and human beings. At the beginning, I mentioned the influence of Robin Wall Kimmerer's writing. Like Terry Tempest William, there's a deep spiritual component to her book, to her work. And recognizing that nature showers us with gifts, it's natural that as fellow creatures, we should respond in kind. Given the current state of the planet, our collapsing ecosystems, declining insect and wildlife populations, the future for us, and I mean us humans, because goodness knows the flies have been around for 200 million years and we haven't, our future is looking uncertain. Inaction should not be an option. Each of us can contribute to a better future for the planet by recognizing our kinship with nature regarding her with gratitude and giving back with acts of generosity. So I know you all know how important it is to plant a pollinator garden, walk instead of drive, get involved with local government to implement positive environmental action, support local farms and conservation groups like the Waltham Land Trust, pick up trash on your street, in your town, in your parks, Go outside and go in search of flies and bugs and look at them now with admiration and wonder. So do we have time for a quiz, Sonia, Diana? Are people interested in a quiz? Yeah, go for it. I mean, folks, if you wanna need to sign off, <clears throat> go right ahead, um, but I'm interested in a quiz. Oh, you really, you wanna try? Don't be I'll nervous. Try. So. Or someone okay, else. one of you will have to call on whoever raises their hand. So, okay, um, the top two photographs. Um, 
Let's compare those two. What do we have? Let me tell you, one of them's a fly. Which one is it? Who's got a guess? The one on the daisy? To, on the left or right? Yeah, on the left. What makes you think that would be a fly? Well, because the one on the right has the long antenna. That's well, the only uh, thing I can see. I can't really see the antenna on the one on the left. Well. Okay, all right. Someone else have a thought? And big eyes. Well, they both have big eyes. They have big eyes. This is tricky. Remember I said that the um, thick-headed flies are really good mimics? They are. They're amazing. <laughs> this is the fly. Hmm. Maybe that's part of the reason why its antennae are kind of longish. It's hard to tell, but here's the antenna curve. Oh. This is a this is the wasp here. This is a gold marked thread waisted wasp, and this is a thick headed fly. And it's hard to see, but that's the knob end of the whole tear sticking out. Okay. All right. On the bottom, only one of those is a fly. Who wants to guess which one is the fly? Uh, Emily Miles Terry has guessed the lower left one. That's right. That's right. And what did you see that made you say that? Antenna. Uh, yeah, um, the, the shorter. Antenna? Okay, very good. That's right. And this is one of those green bottle flies. And this is a um, a lovely orchard bee. And see the long antennae here. Okay, next on the top two, which one is the fly? Left. The left. Yeah. Who said left? Okay, and what made you say that? Big eyes, short antenna. Oh, wait a minute. Right, and this one is the bee, long antenna. But here's another thing to look for when you want to tell the difference on flowers. See the yellow under here? Pollen. That's pollen. That's pollen. Uh, right. The flies are not going to have pollen. They're not going to have pollen on their legs, and they're not going to have pollen on their... Um, What's the what's the thing called that carries the pollen on legs? Anyway, um, they're not going to have pollen legs and on their abdomens. There's bees have all different uh, depending on species, different ways of carrying pollen. Okay, on the bottom, which one's the fly? On the right, right. On the right. Okay, what makes you say that? Short, the short antenna. Also, aren't we seeing pollen on the on the left? On the abdomen, is that pollen? You're seeing pollen on the legs here. Yeah, mm -hmm. the legs. Yeah, yeah, you're seeing pollen here. And this one, I think, has a lot of hairs here to try to make you think that it might be carrying pollen, but it's not. Yeah. Okay, in honor of Valentine's Day, here's the fly with four wings. And here I told you that all flies only have one pair of flight wings. What's going on here? Um, chicka bow wow. <laughs> Little uh, nookie. <laughs> you know, what is it that Erica McAllister said? They love to have sex. They like yeah, that. These are surfeit flies. I see them mating all the time. You, you know, watch them all the time, Linda. <laughs> and um, <laughs> here's the the male, and you can see his little hall tears here and everything. Okay, very good. We're going to be sending to everyone a PDF file with tips for looking and learning and a whole complete resource list. These are only some of the books that I mentioned. Um, I have to add the um, Superfly, which is one that I still am just finishing reading, the one that is a kind of an interesting compilation of research. So. Any questions? There, there was one in the chat. It's from uh, Emily. Um, it's uh, how can you tell the difference between a crane fly and a main sized mosquito? Oh, oh, well, that's a good question. Crane flies are really big and they have very long gangly legs, but they are often mistaken for mosquitoes. Um, so like, yeah, these could be, mistaken for, easily be mistaken for mosquito, <clears throat> right? Because these are small. Um, they have extremely long legs, I might 
go with that one. How did I know they were crane flies? That's how I knew, because I saw their legs. Compared to the mosquito, do I have a, uh, no, I don't really have, a, I don't, I don't have many pictures of mosquitoes at all, actually. I think um, you did have one of the female in one of the earlier slides, I think. Oh, no, no, she's just with, that's just that one. Yeah. Yeah, that's just that one. So, no, I've thought about that. I don't have, uh, I have mis plenty of mosquito um, cupy right here. They're very cool. So, good question. Any other questions? I no, but everything else, aside from some answering to the quiz uh, in the chat, was to uh, comment on uh, what a nice job, uh, good presentation, et cetera. Uh, fantastic presentation, uh, fascinating, um, things okay. like that. So a okay. uh, bunch of those. Love the flies. All I right. Phyllis, though, Phyllis, did I see you raise your hand? Yeah, I had one quick question. Can you tell the difference between a male mosquito and a female mosquito, so you know which one's gonna bite you and which one is not? <laughs> Good question. I have no idea. <laughs> well, you know what? If it lands on your skin, it's not gonna be a male. They just don't drink blood. I don't yeah, think when they're good. near you flying around. Are they probably the females? Okay. My guess would be because the males are sipping nectar. I haven't really read, looked into mosquitoes too much. But yeah, that's a good question. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Linda, that was great. Thank yeah. you, Linda. Yes, Linda, thank you so thank much. You.